Torso dominance is a condition that affects many naturals, especially in the online fitness community. This is where the center of your body is rather thick, but the outer extremities are lagging behind. Natural hypertrophy likes to describe this as the spider physique, typically being a thick chest and upper back with puny arms, which you might have right now, or at least have seen some people with this problem. And yes, it is an issue because let's keep it real, nobody wants to look like that, at least if you have any aesthetic goals. So in today's video, I wanna talk about what causes torso dominance and what you can do to finally fix this problem once and for all. The first and most important contributor is hands down following minimalist training advice, like just getting stronger at the basic compound movements. You want massive triceps? Close your bench. Want big buys? Weighted chin-ups. These two exercises are all you need. So just focus on a high specificity program, get stronger and you'll get bigger because that's what naturals have to do, right? The latter part is 100% correct, but the application is wrong. See, progressive overload is the most important factor, but it can't just be on exercises where your arms are not even the primary movers. Because depending on your genetics, leverages, and even after a certain point, you might end up with a real imbalance, which unfortunately, a lot of you, myself included, learned the hard way. To the point where we were almost in denial because we want to believe that, yeah, just get really strong and you're going to have massive arms. Well, you're looking at someone who did that already. I remember distinctively in 2017, I had a lot of haters back then. They were saying in the comment section, this was a lot of people, Alex, if you get your close grip bench press to 365 and your weighted chin up to four plates, I guarantee 100% you're going to have 17 inch arms. And I rejected the thought process, but because it was that strength bias, because the bodybuilding advice was so bad, I still low key believed in it. Not going to lie. So that's how you know when the brainwashing runs deep, but eventually you get out of that illusion. So I'm going to get to that right now. Last year, 2021, I did a 380 close grip bench press and a four plate weighted pull up, which is arguably even more difficult than a chin. Guess what? The biggest my arms ever were was 16 and a half inches. And this is in a fluffier state, mind you. Meaning the advice didn't work. It was a complete utter failure. But the thing is, who's actually gonna get there to begin with? I was the guinea pig. I was willing to sacrifice years of time because I wanted the strength numbers to begin with and might as well find out, see if it's effective. But for those of you who are probably never gonna get there, it's an easy cop out for these guys because they're just gonna say, get strong, right? Which after a certain point, yeah, you're gonna have some decent musculature. Like I can maintain 15 and a half inches without isolating, right? So it's not bad per se, but the journey itself is so difficult that you might just give up halfway through or never reach it. So then the justification will be, well, it's because I didn't get strong enough. You see how that works out? When in reality, the ideology was flawed from the get go. Not only was it unrealistic for most people, but it was also complete fucking bullshit. It probably won't work. If it didn't work for me, what makes you think it's gonna work for you? Like people have claimed that I have above average genetics. Well, if I bench four plates and it didn't work, why is it gonna work for you? I'm just saying, I'm not a God, I'm nobody special, but come on, use your common sense. And it's not just me. I want you to understand that. I want you to look at some of the real natural power lifters, the ones that don't label themselves as power builders. No, you go on their bio, I'm a fucking power lifter, this is what it is, I don't give a fuck about aesthetics. Those dudes, look at their physiques and look at their totals. Look at the ones that are even stronger than me. What it is, nine out of 10 times, and no, this is not over exaggeration, nine out of 10 times, guys, they have enormous legs, like bodybuilder status. They got shredded, look fucking crazy, right? Huge legs, watermelon pecs, but stick arms. Sometimes even small shoulders, because a lot of them don't overhead press. They just do super wide grip bench. So really, power lifting, okay, two thirds of your total comes from the lower body. And if you bench press with a big arch, with a super wide grip, which is often seen in the lighter weight classes, and you're natty, trying to optimize your leverages, the tricep involvement obviously goes down. So is this not cause and effect? Can you tell me? Like, honestly, guys, look around. 
the only ones that look like bodybuilders, guys like Russell or he, which I actually respect, do bodybuilding work on the side. All the other ones that I've seen seem to not have impressive arms to the point where they can have a 600 to 700 pound deadlift, yet their biceps look identical to your average gym bro who only cares about chest and arms. And for the triceps, you have to understand that the long head will never be maximally developed without direct focus. The compound movements are very lateral based, which gives you that nice horseshoe. And in my case, it's pretty darn developed, especially when I got shredded. I was able to see that. But that's not what increases your muscle measurement the most. If you want the sweep in the back of your arm, such that when you're relaxed, they just look big. It's the long head, bros. And the only way you're going to do that is by isolating your arms with some shoulder extension, as well as doing the overhead motions to get a nice way to stretch. And when we look at hypertrophy research, that appears to be most important in general. So that's the combination that's leaving you guys with puny arms. It's listening to power lifters who don't actually care about having the biggest arms. So I think natural hypertrophy, again, said it best. Stay in your fucking lane. And you don't have to be next. Just like the noobs who ran starting strength. And now their arms are their worst body part. Come on. So that's it for the powerlifting side of things. Now I want to talk about the calisthenics world. Because it seems like there's extremists on every side. You can have a lot of guys who stayed. Just get stronger at the weighted chin up. Or even body weight for that matter. And you'll never have to do another curl for the rest of your life. Your biceps are going to be maximally developed. You're all good, especially when you look at the EMG research. Chin-ups indicate higher bicep activation compared to curls. Is that true? Yes. But what's also true? EMG is flawed by design in many instances. Most of it is junk science, to be honest. And if you want a really good analysis on this topic, which I promise will have you completely reevaluating, watch this video by Dr. Mike Isratil. Hands down, the best segment I've ever seen debunking a lot of the EMG discussions. So, when people would reference that years back and then say, oh, well, look at gymnasts who are doing iron crosses and shit that me or you will never be able to do. First of all, that's not even chins. It's going beyond that. But when they say, oh, just look at general calisthenics athletes, here's what I've noticed. The ones who actually do have good looking biceps, nine out of 10 times, it's not because they have massive biceps. Rather, it's due to them being shredded. And what really made me confirm this is when I got shredded for the first time. If you look at me flexing my arms, the biceps actually look pretty good, surprisingly. But if you were to see me in real life, you'd think to yourself, this guy has puny biceps. In a t-shirt, they didn't look impressive whatsoever. And even when shirtless, it's only when you flex because you see all the separation the definition, the veins. Basically, it's an illusion. It's like those skinny guys you see who are really lean and they get close to a camera and they're flexing like this. They're not actually big, which you would understand if you actually went to an expo in real life and saw these mother****. So I'm not saying that you're not going to have nice arms in general. No, you're going to get some pretty good gains with chin-ups. Like it's much better advice than what the powerlifters are suggesting, straight up. But it's going to come to a halt at some point. What I mean is your back will eventually outpace your biceps by a significant extent. So you just getting stronger and stronger, you might end up getting wider and wider, which isn't a bad thing. That looks pretty badass. Everybody wants a V taper, but your biceps might stall if you're not isolating. And this is why the actual experts, not those dudes you see at the park, just randomly interviewed. No, the real deal, like fitness FAQs will advise direct bicep work, like ring curls, to focus on the short position and pelican curls to focus on the length in position. So that is in fact a maximized way to train. That advice is excellent and you will get huge biceps comparable to natural bodybuilders, 100%. But just doing chins or getting stronger vertical poles is like me telling you to just do lat pull downs. It won't work for a lot of you. And the biggest proof I can give is when you take someone who's strong at weighted chins and you have them do curls, which is the purest function of the biceps, elbow flexion. When you actually test the isolation strength, what you'll find in many cases is that it's equivalent to a guy who's significantly weaker than you on chin-ups. Why? 
because the primary mover of a chin up is your back first and foremost. The biceps only aid secondarily. So you've seen what I'm capable of curling. How come a lot of my audience can curl the same amounts of weight? This is not even over exaggeration. Like that's probably one of the few things you can relate to me on strength wise. We curl the same weights. And does it show in my biceps? 100% it does. Yet, I have an elite vertical pole that, I'm sorry, 99% of you guys will never reach. Yet, we're the same in the biceps. So basically, guys, minimalist training is why your arms are small. Now, I want to dive into being lazy with your arm training because that's another fact that goes into this because some of you are going to say, well, actually, some of these athletes do isolate and they do promote it. Sure, but it's completely half-assed to the point where you might as well just skip it completely because it's not doing you any favors or it's approached in the wrong way. So, how many guys have actually tried an arm day? Just for a very simple example. Most haven't because it's always been thought of as this bro ideology kind of day it's only what juice heads do and again if you just get stronger at the compounds and hit an isolation in your program you're going to be just fine to a certain point obviously so basically when these torso dominant lifters specialize in the bench press or the overhead press or the squat or whatever the f they're trying to get stronger at they see good muscle gains in the primary movers for those exercises as well as explosive strength gains Yet, when we tell them, specialize in your arms, go through a phase where that's going to be the primary focus. Maybe the other stuff goes in the back burner for now. It's like, ah, uh, I don't want to do that. Does that make sense? Now, look, I'm not saying you got to do an arm day, but it's just an example. The real issue is actually what you do after your compounds. Many times, you're fried and you just want to get the workout over with. Or if you do have a lot of energy, not much thought goes into the isolation work. You won't rest a lot between your sets. You won't push the intensity. And you'll remain weak for months at a time, lifting the exact same numbers. Which is why if you were to get a workout log or film yourself, it would be extremely helpful. Because now it's going to force you to be accountable. So what I'm saying is you want to use things like double progression on your bodybuilding motions. And stop calling them accessories, by the way. This is something that I discussed with Basement Bodybuilding recently, and I highly recommend you all subscribe to his channel. He's got some excellent content debunking a lot of the minimalist ideologies that are so present in this fitness world. So basically, instead of calling a curl an accessory to your chin up, consider it a primary movement for your biceps. That is actually a full set for your biceps. Because when we calculate total weekly volume, people are going to say, okay, you've got to do 10, 20 sets a week. Sure, but then they're going to calculate the chins as three sets of biceps. Are you f***ing serious? That's not three sets. If you really want to be nice, it's one set, I would say. But even then, we can't actually quantify it. So I would say forget about all that. The bicep direct volume is what really matters. And I would say if you're doing two curls a workout twice a week, you probably have enough volume in. And if you want to go super extreme, you could throw in three. But basically, you got to hit a movement that hits... The shorn position, so your squeeze base exercises, the lengthened position, though not as important for biceps specifically, but things like incline dumbbell curls, Bayesian curls, anything where the resistance is heaviest at the very start of the movement, even pelican curls like I talked about before, that's excellent. And then there's just the mid position, like your classic barbell curls, dumbbell curls, etc. If you do all three and get way strong over time, I guarantee that'll do more for you than any compound movement because you're doing the purest function hitting your muscle at different lengths, adequate volume as well. This is actually the way. And it's what natural bodybuilders actually do. <laughs> like if you want to look at the people with the biggest biceps on the planet, those are the training methods. It's way more efficient. It has one goal in mind. If you're not making gains off that, then I don't know what to tell you. And then for triceps, same thing. You want to do something like a push down so you can get a nice squeeze on your arms. I specifically recommend dual cables or dual ropes or anything that involves shoulder extension this way you get the long head activation in there too as well as a stretch based motion overhead extensions being most common but you can also do it off a decline anything where you can get the arm way back here 
is going to be best. Heck, it could be including bent arm pullovers, you know. Just don't rely strictly on your presses. So that's it. Same strategy as biceps. Two to three motions twice a week, or you can combine everything once a week. You're good to go. That's how you actually get big arms. Elbow flexion with elbow extension. And I think a good example that proves this is looking at guys like Jeffrey Verity Schofield. His isolation work is so freaking strong, especially on the triceps, that I can't even budge what he's doing for one rep. And look at that. Is it surprising that he gained an inch on his arms an entire year? And I didn't. Yet my compound movements went up by a significant amount, not to mention not even training like your typical powerlifter. I used a lot of accommodating resistance. I incorporated geared powerlifting strategies, which actually do bias the triceps more. And I did isolate to a certain extent, but I wasn't emphasizing the long head and I wasn't doing enough volume. You see what I'm saying? So there's strength in the compounds and there's strength in the isolation. The isolation is going to be way more accurate in the context of arm development. By the way, this also includes the topic of form. Because sometimes people are going to get stronger, on paper at least, yet when you actually look at the footage, they're throwing out their back, the arms are all over the place, these reps aren't clean. And for biceps, the biggest mistake would actually be raising the elbows way too high. So shoulder flexion, because you've all been taught, oh, shoulder flexion is a secondary function of the biceps. Yeah, it's secondary for a damn reason. doesn't mean that you turn your curls into a front raise. I would actually recommend keeping everything mostly stationary. And then as you get fatigued, you can start to raise them a little bit. But on every rep, it shouldn't look like this, which some guys have promoted on TikTok. Like a stable, consistent arm is always gonna be better for mass. So either lock yourself in or include a little bit of that stuff. But don't overdo it, okay? And then for triceps, same thing. Guys are gonna raise their arms constantly and turn it into more of like a lat assisted exercise. Or they're gonna start pressing the weight, becoming internally rotated and overloading per se, but again, they're hitting the lateral head of their triceps. So what you want is to emphasize the long head. That means using the correct attachment and bringing the arms back here, not there doing these reps. So that's about all I can say for that. Cheap form it does have its applications, but it shouldn't be your default for everything that you do. Next, let's talk about arm length. From what I've noticed, guys with proportionally shorter arms compared to their height tend to have a more difficult time building their arms, specifically the triceps. And I think this has to do with the range of motion that's achieved on most compound movements. Now, going back to the first point, I never said that compounds won't grow your arms. I'm just saying that relying on them exclusively isn't optimal. And after a certain point, you're gonna stall if you're not isolating the proper way. So the gains that you do make from your compounds, obviously a lot of that is gonna be related to your structure, right? So when you have shorter arms, the range of motion is decreased to the point where you get less extension of the arm. So what do we know about hypertrophy training? Well, more range of motion is better. That means if you're doing a full range of motion close grip bench press, you actually can get better tricep gains than doing quarter reps. And this has been consistent with all the research. So if you have a build where your arm is way above your torso, some would actually say, oh, that must mean it's more triceps because you're getting less of a stretch on your pecs. But in reality, the total work that you do is gonna be a little bit less and the joint angles aren't optimal per se. Now, does that mean that short to average length arm guys are screwed? No, in fact, your arm is gonna look proportionally bigger because you're stock here. If your arms are 15 inches, they might look the same as a taller guy who has 16 and a half inch arms. Even though, if he were to stand right next to you, you could see there's a difference, but as it relates to your frame, the overall proportions, the symmetry is where I'm getting at here. It's gonna look almost identical. Anyway, enough about that. Now I wanna talk about genetics and how that plays a role in your overall arm size. So let's keep it real. Some people legitimately do not have the best arm genetics. It is what it is, life isn't fair. Depending on your muscle belly fullness, the arm insertions, and in general, how you respond to stimulus compared to other body parts, you might end up with lagging arms even if you're doing everything perfectly. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it is true that in some areas, you might be blessed, others be average, and then sometimes below average. Maybe for you, that happens to be the arms, but everything else is super jacked. Heck, we see this in the pro realms. 
Some guys really know what they're talking about, like say, hypertrophy coach. Yet he's always said that arms were one of his most stubborn body parts. John Meadows had a stubborn upper back. These are guys who are trying to win at the highest level possible with good credentials, a lot of coaching experience, and they can often bring someone else to an even higher status than themselves even though they're training the same way. That's genetics. If all your peers have 18 inch arms, yet look relatively similar stature wise, and you have 17, what do you wanna do about it? I'm not saying you have a genetic limit to your arms per se, but some people just don't respond the same way. And you can't get mad. All you really can do is continue focusing on things you have control over. Progressive overload, embracing the long-term grind, picking the right exercises, being really smart with your training. You gotta have everything dialed in correctly. And what I can say is that doing this will be much better than giving up. Because once you've done that, you've ensured that you're no longer gonna make any gains in the arms. When you probably did have more room for improvement, just that it's not gonna be easy. So I mentioned this point just to give a little bit of realism. And to conclude that, I'd also throw in the quick topic of body dysmorphia. There are some of you who actually don't have bad arm genetics and don't have small arms and actually do look impressive in real life. In fact, a huge percentage of people who label themselves as torso dominant are not. They just have body dysmorphia. And certainly this applies to most natty fitness influencers. Almost all of us have some degree of body dysmorphia. That's just the name of the fitness industry. We are surrounded by steroid users. And as much as we don't wanna compare, sometimes it can be hard not to. That's why my best advice is to unfollow the majority of these people unless they happen to give great advice and you actually are benefiting. But for every time you look at their stuff, you just feel discouraged, unmotivated, and then you think that you're small, well, you're not really benefiting. It's just negative at that point. So just keep that in mind. A lot of you don't have issues. Like this is something I've seen in my comment sections over many years. Some people are like, Alex, I wish I had arms like you. And for your height, that's actually good. And you know what? Logically, I know that they're right. Like I get it. But then I'll look at some other guys who have a similar structure and they got 17, 17.5. And it's like, I know that I could reach that number. And I know that's not because of genetics, but because I was misled by following improper advice. So. I know my capabilities. That's why there's a little bit of body dysmorphia in there. And I always set a high standard for myself. But at the end of the day, like, yeah, my arms aren't bad per se. They're just proportionally lagging to a certain extent. Though again, some of you might be like, but they're not. So that's why I'm saying, if I have a bit of body dysmorphia and some of the top naturals also have it, then what makes you think that you don't have it? Just some food for thought. With that said, guys, there's not much else for me to say. I hope you enjoyed this exclusive discussion on torso dominance, and I wanna hear your feedback in the comment section. Do you have the spider physique? Have you combated it? Let's hear everything, and I'll see you in the next video.